Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion. MCQ discussion number 13. Let's get started. So the first question, a 38 year old man presents to the emergency department for severe alcohol abuse with nausea and vomiting. He has a significant medical history of chronic heavy alcohol consumption. The patient is confused and hepatomegaly is seen on physical examination. A liver biopsy was done and the liver cells were found to have eosinophilic cytoplasmic inclusion bodies as shown in the image. What are these bodies composed of? A. Neurofilament B. Desmin filament C. Vimentin filament or D. Keratin filament So pause, think, process the question and then we'll discuss. So first, let's look at the history, right? So you have a chronic alcoholic who comes with an acute pinch of alcohol nausea, vomiting, confusion, and on examination, you found hepatomegaly. So when you see chronic alcoholic, hepatomegaly, and these features of nausea, vomiting, confusion, the only thing that really comes to your mind is an alcoholic liver disease. So a history very indicative of an alcoholic liver disease. So here we have a case of alcoholic liver disease. So now we did a liver biopsy from this patient, and on histopathology, these pink eosinophilic inclusion bodies were seen within the hepatocytes. So they are cytoplasmic inclusion bodies. So here I'll show you, this is the hepatocyte and here you have a dark pink staining body. So that's a cytoplasmic, you can see a eosinophilic or a pink staining uh, inclusion body in the cytoplasm of these cells. So this was the HPE of this patient with alcoholic liver disease. And the question is, what are these bodies composed of? So to answer that question, you need to know two things. Firstly, what is the pathological or what are these pathological bodies seen in alcoholic liver disease called? And the second thing you need to know is what are these alcoholic or what are these bodies composed of? So remember, in alcoholic liver disease, you see something called Mallory bodies or Mallory Denk bodies. So essentially, Mallory Denk bodies or Mallory bodies are pathognomic for alcoholic liver disease. Okay, so a few things about Mallory Denk bodies because again, high yield topic. So Mallory Denk bodies are also called alcoholic hyaline bodies. They are seen mainly in alcoholic liver disease and they are primarily composed of keratin filaments. Keratin filament 8 and 18 to be particular, but they are primarily composed of keratin filaments. They are clumped eosinophilic bodies, again, intracytoplasmic. They lie in the cytoplasm of the cell, so they are clumped intracytoplasmic eosinophilic bodies that are seen in the ballooned hepatocytes seen in ALD. So in alcoholic liver disease, you get ballooning of hepatocytes and in these ballooned or enlarged hepatocytes, you will find, or in the cytoplasm of these enlarged hepatocytes, you will find small clumps of pink material or small pink eosinophilic bodies called Mallory Denk bodies. So very high yield Mallory Denk bodies. So let's review Mallory Denk bodies in one line. Mallory Denk bodies or alcoholic hyaline bodies are seen in alcoholic liver disease. They are eosinophilic intracytoplasmic inclusion bodies seen in the balloon hepatocytes that are composed of keratin filaments. Okay, so that was Mallory Denk bodies. So remember ALD, alcoholic liver disease, Mallory Denk bodies. A little trivia, okay, a little trivia for the uh, AIMS exams and all the Central Institute exams. Mallory Denk bodies can also be seen in obesity, Indian childhood cirrhosis, Wilson's disease and PBC. So obesity, ICC, Wilson's disease and primary biliary cirrhosis. These are few and other conditions where you can see Mallory Denk bodies. Now let's talk a little bit about this question and then firstly we'll answer the question. So what are these composed of? So we, we realized ALD you see Mallory Denk bodies and Mallory Denk bodies are composed of keratin filaments. So the answer is D, mostly keratin filament 8 and 18. But remember, answer is D, keratin filaments. Now let's talk a little bit about these filaments and what do you mean by neurofilament, desmin filament, filamentum filament. So I'll try to simplify this. So these filaments are essentially substances that help form the cytoplasmic structure in a cell normally. And they are called intermediary filaments and or intermediate filaments and there are five types of intermediate filaments that we need to know about. So the first type is a neurofilament which is seen in the neurons or the cytoplasm of the neurons. The second is the desmin filament seen in the muscle cells. C or the third type is the vimentin filament which is seen in the fibrous tissue. Then you have your keratin filament seen in epithelial tissue and lastly you have something called glial filament which is seen in the neuroglia. 
for those who attended the CNS tumor session, you know about the glial filaments. So neuroglia show glial, glial filaments. So neurofilaments in neurons, desmin filaments in muscles, vimentin filaments in fibrous tissue, keratin filaments in epithelial tissue, and lastly, glial filaments in glial tissue. So these have some diagnostic properties to or diagnostic value to, and that's why they're important. So that was about intermediate filaments. And most importantly, the high yield topic, malary bodies or malary dank bodies seen in alcoholic liver disease. So you should not identify them also. You saw from this picture, they're inter, inter, you can see here also. Okay. So that was about malary dank bodies. Let's go to question number two for today. Apixaban. Apixaban is a A oral direct thrombin inhibitor, B parenteral direct thrombin inhibitor, C factor 10A inhibitor or D antifibrinolytic. So pause, think and then we'll discuss. So there are three reasons I've included this question. The first reason is it's a previous year question. Yes, it's a previous year question. The second reason is that this is a high yield topic. Anticoagulants is a high yield topic. And third reason is because there's a little trick that can help you answer these kind of questions very easily or at least the questions related to this drug and maybe a few other questions related to anticoagulants in a very easy manner. So the answer here is C, factor 10A inhibitor. And how do you remember this? Remember the name of this drug is Zaban and it has XA in it. It has XA in it. XA is nothing but factor 10A. And shockingly, it even has XABAN. So ban 10A, ban 10A or inhibit 10a so factor 10a inhibits or factor 10a inhibitors are all zabans and they most importantly have xa in it so you can never you should never forget xa means a factor 10a inhibitor so this you can use in two places one when direct questions are asked like this and two to also rule out options sometimes apixaban could be an option and the question could be which is a direct thrombin inhibitor so you know xa means it is it is going to be a 10A, so that's not the answer. So you can use this simple fact in many ways and answer many questions from anticoagulants with just this one point. So remember, factor XA inhibitors and all the factor XA inhibitors or factor 10A inhibitors have XA in it. So remember, in the coagulation cascade, you have an extrinsic and intrinsic pathway and a common pathway and the XA or factor 10A or factor 10 plays a role in the common pathway. And these drugs directly inhibit those path that factor 10A. Another point, they are always oral drugs. So there are no parenteral factor 10 inhibitors, just oral 10 inhibitors that are important. Now a little bit about anticoagulants because it is again high yield. So remember there are four important classes of anticoagulants that we need to know about. The first one is your vitamin K antagonists. Second is your direct thrombin inhibitors. These directly inhibit thrombin. Third one indirect thrombin inhibitors. And fourth one, the direct factor 10A inhibitors, they inhibit 10A. So a little bit about vitamin K antagonists. So vitamin K antagonists, the most important one is warfarin. And you know vitamin K is required for gamma carboxylation and functioning of clotting factors and synthesis of clotting factors. So when vitamin K is deficient, clotting factors also will be affected. So remember, warfarin is the only important vitamin K antagonist and it's an oral drug. Now, direct thrombin inhibitors, this is what we don't really study about and this is where maximum questions come from. So, the very important and the most important drug among this discussion is the dabigatran. Remember, dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor and it is an oral direct thrombin inhibitor. So, I used to remember it as D for D. So, dabigatran for direct. So, dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor and it's an oral direct thrombin inhibitor. There are, And it is the only oral direct thrombin inhibitor Again, more reason for it to be asked. So parenteral, you have a few. Important one is lepirudin, but you can also know about desirudin, but lepirudin is the important parenteral direct thrombin inhibitor. Then you have indirect thrombin inhibitors. They are the most famous heparin, low molecular weight heparins and fontaparinox. And among low molecular weight heparins, enoxaparin is the important one. So heparin, low molecular weight heparins and also fontaparinox are the important indirect thrombin inhibitors. And lastly, the fun part, the direct 10A inhibitors, remember I told you they are all oral and remember you saw this, the names Apixaban, Rivoraxaban, Rivo Edoxaban and Betrixaban. So all have XA in it, all have XA in it. So whenever you see XA and the question is anti -question, anticoagulant related, remember it is factor 10A inhibitor. Okay, so factor 10A, Zaban, factor 10A, Zaban. Remember this, this is a high yield point or this is a nice trick which will help you a lot. Other than that, I want you to remember Dabigatran is a direct thrombin inhibitor. 
so let's go to question number three for today right yeah so the third question for today is from pediatrics i'm not too strong in pediatrics but we'll this is important so i've included it so question number three according to imnci a six month old child is said to have pneumonia if the child has a respiratory rate of more than a 60 b 50 c 30 and d 40 so uh, pause think sorry for that pause think and then we'll discuss yeah so before we discuss in detail about this question let's talk a little about imnci and the imnci classification and then we'll know why this question was important so remember imnci is an organization or a group called uh, which stands and it stands for integrative management of neonatal and childhood illnesses and they give syndromic approaches for certain diseases seen in children so what is syndromic approach they give fixed protocols on how to treat a certain set of clinical symptoms so if a, a set of clinical symptoms is called a syndrome so a patient comes with those fixed symptoms they give you a guideline on how to treat this is particularly to particularly to help the doctors in the peripheral sector and the general practitioners so imnca has classified pneumonia into three categories okay three categories the first category is called no pneumonia the second category is called pneumonia and the third category is called severe pneumonia so no pneumonia pneumonia and severe pneumonia no pneumonia is green pneumonia is yellow and severe pneumonia is pink and severe obviously is the most severe so what is this no pneumonia so no pneumonia is a condition usually we, we think it's an urti or it has features of urti so the patient will come with or the child will come with cold and cough but no other symptoms okay so usually there are no, there is just cold and cough and for these patients you do something called a home-based care so no pneumonia is green it's trivial probably a urti so home-based care home remedies and cough syrups can be used some nasal decongestions or drugs which help a cold and cough can be given so it's home treatment but remember even though you're a home treatment you tell the mother that she should follow up if the symptoms get worse or if there are danger signs. So we'll talk about the danger signs a little later. So home treatment, there is no antibiotics. That's what you have to remember. There's no antibiotics. It's just supportive care and to uh, cough care or uh, home remedies for throat irritation or to soothe irritation. So that was about green, no pneumonia, home-based care. Second one is yellow or pneumonia. So yellow or pneumonia is the second grade. And how do you know this? It is cough with fast breathing or what we call tachycardia okay so cough with fast breathing or cough with sorry tachypnea sorry tachypnea cough with tachypnea is indicative of pneumonia okay and what do you do in pneumonia you start on oral antibiotics so usually the drug we give is amoxicillin most given drug is amoxicillin so oral amoxicillin is given for five days along with home remedies and patient is treated at home so there is no admission patient comes with tachypnea and fast breathing you start on oral amoxicillin or oral antibiotics for five days and follow up in two days and again if danger symptoms are there they should immediately repeat the third category is the pink or the severe category or severe pneumonia so where all do you see severe pneumonia firstly if there is strider secondly if the child is malnourished and most importantly the danger signs so i told you earlier if you see danger signs in green and yellow you should bring the patient so what are these danger signs firstly any seizures or epilepsy any conventions shown by the child inability to feed lethargy of the child reduced activity of the child and malnutrition so malnutrition lethargy uh, inability to feed child not drinking water and convulsions so these are some danger signs which in any grade if it's seen the mother should immediately report to the doctor so if a patient comes with any of these symptoms and features of pneumonia, including fast breathing, ch ch strider, chest drawing, it's a severe pneumonia and we have to urgently treat it. So IV antibiotics are given and the child requires ICU admission. So if you're in the periphery, refer to higher center. If you're in a tertiary center, immediately admit the child to the ICU. So that was the classification. I'll go through it one more time quickly. There are three classes, no pneumonia, pneumonia and severe pneumonia. No pneumonia is upper respiratory usually child comes with cough and cold but no tachypnea no chest in drawing no strider home based care is given second is pneumonia which there is tachypnea with cough cold whatever and this is indicative of an lrti so we give oral antibiotics usually amoxicillin for five days and review after two days lastly any danger signs which we discussed or child presence with strider you would give 
or you need immediate care because triadic indicates a severe respiratory disease so immediate care has to be given start on antibiotics if if available iv or at least oral antibiotics and immediately shift to higher center if you are in higher center icu admission and supportive care for these severe pneumonia so those were the three categories of imnci that are important now a little question mark has come so imnci says that chest in drawing comes under severe pneumonia but the latest guidelines of the latest who guidelines say that chest in drawing also should come under pneumonia so chest in drawing comes under pneumonia another point this applies to only 2 months to 5 years so all children from 2 months to 59 months or 2 months to 5 years this applies any child less than 2 months okay that is a neonate there is no thing called pneumonia every pneumonia in a neonate is severe so every pneumonia in that age group is severe and therefore there is only no pneumonia or severe pneumonia there is no just pneumonia so that was about the different classifications of imnci so now we said the diagnosis of pneumonia is based on the what is the most important feature to diagnose pneumonia the respiratory rate or tachypnea okay so the diagnosis of pneumonia is based on tachypnea so what is tachypnea for different ages so this applies from 2 months to 5 years so remember for the first 12 months so 2 months to 12 months tachypnea is considered as any rate over 50 and for 1 to 5 years tachypnea is considered at any rate over 40 again this is imnci chest in drawing is now part of pneumonia and strider means severe pneumonia so that's not important 2 to 12 months so 2 months to 1 year it is more than 50 and 1 year to 5 years it is more than 40 so the answer here is b 50 because it's a 6 month child so that is between 2 months and 1 1 year so it should be more than 50 so why is this a controversial question because we read in neonatology usually it is up to 1 year we can accept 30 to 60 right 30 to 60 is accepted up to 1 year but and some sources say 55 also but remember the question is according to imnci and imnci classifies someone as yellow or pneumonia when the rate is more than 50 okay so tachy tachypnea per se may be 60 but when it's more than 50 we categorize under pneumonia and that's why rr is very important in children or respiratory rate is very important in children so that's it for today uh, sorry took a little extra time and sorry we are posting a little late got a little busy but i hope it was useful and this imnci and syndromic approach and this classification is very important very high yield and i will see you guys tomorrow